go. All right, everybody, we're here for another night. So excited, same painters, same people behind uh, the computer. So we're really excited. We're gonna get started because all of us are very eager to get into another night of painting. Please tell us where you're from, tell us what you're doing. Uh, love for you to paint along. Uh, the, I'm sure the reference images are in the description. All you have to do is click on the link. Also in the description, we are doing our holiday sale of all of these painting demos. All the painting demos uh, help support the artists that are here, as well as help support East Oak Studio to be able to continue to produce these. So uh, without further ado, we're gonna get started and we look forward to having you paint along. All right. Usually at this point, I'm like, all right, model, get ready. <laughs> but our model's been ready for two days now. <laughs> and for at the beginning, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, hand off, we only have a couple of mics, I'm gonna hand off my mic to Chelsea. So everybody ask Chelsea questions. That'll give me a chance to concentrate <laughs> for the first little bit. It's my evil plan. anybody had any revelations since yesterday's session like anything that jumps out at you like how on earth did I miss that thing or wow I really need to start with this um, <laughs> my, <laughs> my background is way too yellow um, I could cool it down a bit and I think that'll help some of the warmth in the foreground to come forward and so I love having another fresh day to, a fresh eye, another day to, to assess my painting and um, take advantage of having it all laid in and now I can reassess it and see what are some things I can make better, you know, layer on top and work with what I've already done. Yeah, I totally feel you. I feel like this is I don't know, you could read the color harmony of this a couple different ways, but mm -hmm. I definitely see it as being a very subdued complementary color scheme. Yes. And it'd be very easy to accidentally pull it too warm or too cool or have two parts of the painting that are very disjointed, which is how I'm currently feeling about this. And I sort of have the opposite problem. Like my background feels very cool. And then the bread and the, um, the surface all feel very, very orange, and I'm gonna to have to do something to unify those two parts. I am just realizing how thin my paint application was yesterday, so I'm really gonna to try to focus on getting more material on the surface and just trying to work quickly. In general, my approach today will actually be slower than yesterday spending more time observing, um, maybe less time covering the, the canvas, uh, trying to work with what I've already laid in, and then being very deliberate and thoughtful um, at this stage. I find in general my block-ins tend to be fast, and then the longer the painting progresses in a way, like the slower I have to be painting in order to make good decisions. Do you feel like in painting slower, you are actively trying to bring a section to completion before you move on? Or what's sort of your, your aim or the thing that keeps you in check in terms of the speed at which you're working? I try to work in general from general to specific. So if there's a big thing that I need to adjust, like for example, the background takes up a lot of space. So that's probably the first thing I'm going to work on and it of course influences the mood of the whole thing. So I try to work on those bigger things first. Um, and then I will pretty much just observe the painting and see what needs the most attention. You know, what things maybe don't read very well or look too generic or 
you know, maybe there's a drawing thing or a scale thing, something seems off, I'll kind of work around the painting, making sure the whole thing is kind of synced up at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and then if it's necessary, I will um, you know, try to finish something to a, a higher level if it's like my focal point or if something's lacking. But um, I will try to have the whole painting kind of at the same level because this is a sketch, this is a limited amount of time. Um, it won't be like highly rendered uh, any of it because of, of um, the nature of this, of this exercise. And so um, it's a lot about keeping everything at a synced up level. So if I did have to ab abandon it, um, it could still work as a painting. Mm -hmm. Evie, you mentioned wanting to build up your paint thickness a little bit. How will you know that you have reached the ideal paint consistency today? I think um, I will be happy once I reach a point where it feels as though everything in the composition is leading toward a central line of focus, um, which is something that Lewis and I had, had talked about a bit after filming yesterday. Um, and you know, especially in, in a project like this where you're just creating a, a quick sketch under a limit of time, um, trying to decide a hierarchy of, of importance uh, in your subject and in your composition. Um, and so I, my game plan is to try to use heftier amounts of paint in an effort to create that focus. Um, so yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully it'll pay off. What about you, Chelsea? Oh, goodness. <laughs> it's so much easier to ask the question. <laughs> um, in terms of my focus or like kind of how do I know, like specific to like paint consistency, where, where, should, where yeah. should I take my answer? Well, like what, um, where are your thoughts as far as like what, what you're aiming to focus on today or what you're aiming to accomplish? Yeah, it's a good question in particular because I don't paint still life very often. Um, I find that it's a very different experience from working on portraits. One, because I find portraits inherently keep me really focused and engaged with the subject. I love capturing a personality. Um, and I know wonderful still life painters will say that a scene like this has a tremendous amount of personality, but it is fundamentally a different thing. Um, and so I'm trying to honestly be <laughs> um, like patient and kind to myself today um, and just really being open to however this turns out and whatever I can learn from it. Um, I think in some ways that's a little bit of a cop-out, so on a technical level, um, I'm thinking about what parts of this am I really enjoying looking at? Not like on my painting, but in the scene. Um, and for me, the rendering of the small bowl that's next to the bread is especially interesting. Um, and then the second thing that I really find myself looking at is the... Um, is, like, is it a carafe? I don't know, the, the bottle of olive oil. Um, and That's so... I, I call it a bottle. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a technical term. <laughs> um, yeah, so if I can get those two particular areas on my painting to a place where I enjoy looking at those objects in the painting, that will be enough for me. Um, and I am somewhat specifically avoiding getting sucked into the bread because for me it literally is the background mm. um, and there's a lot of noise there's a lot of visual noise and unless I like take my glasses off it is difficult to simplify so I'm gonna try and resist the temptation to get really pulled into that piece yeah I think that was perhaps my my pitfall yesterday was getting a little too wrapped up in in the bread um, and going a little bit too far into detail in, in that one particular section and therefore neglecting a lot of the surrounding environment. <laughs> Having a good um, economy of focus, um, I think is really something that I'm trying to work on. To your credit though, I feel like the bread is sort of the star of your painting. So 
I can see how that decision could work in your favor, but as somebody who also focused her time yesterday on <laughs> the piece that she was like most interested in, <laughs> um, I feel you. Do you have any advice, Chelsea, for folks listening, if, if that's a common problem, which I believe it is with a lot of painters, um, how to sort of like, I guess, like reframe your attention when you find yourself getting too caught up too quickly in one area? Is there anything that you'd like to do particularly? That's, that's an interesting question. And I feel like I'm not, not the best person to answer it as we work on still life because it's very much plaguing me at the moment. Um, but in general, like if I were thinking about how I move from section to section in the portrait, I will typically go from areas of high confidence to low confidence. And I think that's a, an area in which it is helpful to say, start with the bread or start with the bowl, like start with the thing that you feel like you know how to paint and that can help you key in the rest of the piece and like really ground the decisions you make in the rest of the painting. Um, so in that way, I am not cursing Chelsea from yesterday <laughs> um, for focusing on these areas because I can really see what I'm gravitating to in that area of the painting and use that to help me with everything from like value decisions to color harmony to how much information I want to put in the painting, um, especially in portraiture and like passages of the face where maybe I can't figure out what on earth that color in the shadow is. Oftentimes if I lay in color or values that I'm more confident with and there's just this one missing piece of the puzzle, I then have enough context to solve that problem. Okay, so we have some people in the chat. Let's see, we have Joyce and she says, hi everyone from Mo." Mokitio, Washington. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Um, she says, I have a favor to ask. Could each of you add a sticker with your name on it somewhere visible on your easels? So what I'm going to do is go through each shot and just say whose painting it is for now. So this one right here, we're going to have um, Erica's. And I'm going to put your guys' Instagram handles in the chat. That way they can go see more of your work if they want to. And then um, this one here is going to be Evie's. So she's working on the cutting board. And then this is going to be Lewis's. And then we also have Chelsea, but she's working off camera. I feel like I got away with like a heist or something. Like, haha, I get to paint this still life and no one has to see all the poor decisions I make. <laughs> <laughs> Secret agent painter. Yeah. Okay, I'm really curious if this is just me and my eye is fresher today, but I could have sworn that the surface that everything is sitting on was a lot warmer yesterday. Which, just, which part of the surface? Um, definitely the plane that's facing us. Um, like this wood the, board the, the, the wood, mm -hmm. yes. The wood that's under the bread and the cutting boards. I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't think, I don't think it is. Cool. <laughs> it's it's like, magically okay. color changing wood. <laughs> You're like, cool, it's just me. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, I know that sounded like really short, but at the same time, like, if everybody had agreed, then we could problem solve. But the fact that like, it's not important tells me I can just change it. I can just, <laughs> hey. yeah. I think this will be helpful too because my primary critique of this is that my color is not feeling cohesive. I kind of have like a warm half and a cool half of the painting and so cooling off the wood is going to be really helpful. Yeah. 
Yeah, I love that bowl. Kind of want to steal it from you, to be honest. Well, now if I find it, <laughs> Where did that bowl come from? Do you do you know? Um, I believe it was a wedding gift of a, pot, a famous potter in Mississippi named Pete, um, who studied under another really famous potter and has a very similar style. What's his last name? Uh, Pete is is what his signature name is. I think that is his. Okay. Name, but I don't know what his last name is. Yeah, I really, I don't know. It's instead of collecting mugs with like pithy sayings on them, I really like collecting mugs with like really nice ceramic textures and glazes on them. And that's like exactly the kind of texture that I would love to have in mugs or in like a bowl like that. I slowly want to replace all of my kitchenware that's not handmade. I, I hear you. I love that kind of thing too. So we also have Viguin from Moscow and they want to know if you guys also paint with watercolors. With watercolor on occasion, um, if I'm, you know, trying to figure out the design of a, of a composition or, you know, particular color harmony, harmonies, um, I find also like, you know, if you're traveling or if you're on the move, um, there's a lot of really amazing uh, small portable watercolor sets that you can get just so that you, you know, no matter where you are, you kind of always have something on hand to work from. Um, I haven't done it in a while though. I personally, I honestly kind of prefer gouache um, to watercolor just because there's more room for a color intensity um, that I think is a little bit more, more easy to control. Um, and you also don't have to worry quite so much about drying time. Um, yeah, watercolor is really fun though. I personally don't have much experience with, with watercolor, but I was messing around with it during um, pandemic times as, as something where, we were talking about this I think yesterday or at some point, where it's something where I don't have to be good at it. Like I, don't, mm. I can do it and just do it for the fun of it and not, um, and not because I have to have it be the quality to sell or be part of my professional uh, work. And so I, so I have painted a little bit with it, but not at all to the uh, it kind of skill level that I aspire to do with uh, painting or oil painting. That's a really interesting point. Like how has y'all's perspective on art making changed since you began doing it on a professional basis like did you need did you find there was any change at all did you find that you needed like a new creative outlet or have you noticed any change at all mm. i i've always had a habit of jumping around from material to material or, or you know craft practice to craft practice and um you know having a background in ceramics and sculpture and uh, fiber art and textile design, um, I'm constantly supplementing my day between, you know, painting and, and work and uh, professional work at least, and um, just creating for myself in, in my free time. Um, and I think it's a really great way to kind of allow yourself a mental reset. Um, while still, you know, keeping your, your creative juices flowing, so to speak. To have, you know, a hobby or anything where it's not the thing that you are having to do professionally. I think it's a healthy thing to do. 
Could you talk a little bit more, um, Evie, about what you said about like really focusing in on a particular um, like medium or way of working? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, historically I've, I've described myself as an interdisciplinary artist. Um, and I, I certainly described myself that way more when I was producing more textile work. Um, and I was constantly finding, um, you know, lessons and values and similarities between uh, different disciplines. So as a textile designer and a weaver, um, I was actually learning a lot about painting and drawing um, in the realm of, uh, you know, composition and design um, and how to maintain focal interest in a piece. And it was really valuable to learn, to learn that through a medium that is so different from painting um, and kind of like being able to still retain a cohesive visual language across different disciplines. Um, I, think it's, I think it's actually like extremely valuable. Um, and, you know, when I was in college, um, I studied at the Maryland Institute College of Art, and I originally went to pursue my BFA in painting. And I very quickly realized that the type of education that I would get from their painting department was not really what I was looking for. Um, it was very concept-based and um, honestly, like it was just a bit of a toxic environment um, to learn in. And so I left, um, which I never thought I would do. And I left and I joined the ceramics department and became a ceramics major. And my rationale there was, well, I can still learn about painting and drawing and, you know, retain these, these values and these lessons that I've been seeking um, while exploring a different uh, media. Um, and I think having that degree of flexibility um, and the ability to see the relationship between different disciplines um, is exceptionally valuable. Um, so I would definitely recommend to any folks out there who feel maybe just like a little bit stuck or, you know, maybe they've been trying to learn, learn something in, in one medium and they're not really getting it. Um, don't be afraid to just jump outside, outside of your comfort zone and outside of your boundaries and, you know, explore, explore another discipline because um, you might just learn what you've been trying to seek all along, you know? Do you feel like now that you are really focused on painting once more, um, do you suspect that you will like stay here for a while and kind of use other media as kind of that supplement or like mental break? Or um, how has your relationship with wanting to diversify changed since college? That's a really, that's a great question and a very complicated question, or at least it has a very complicated answer. Um, I fully intend to, you know, keep painting the rest of my life. Um, I'm, it is my first love and um, I will never not love it. Um, and, you know, I, I also intend to keep, um, keep that flexibility and, and sort of a student's spirit um, around just constantly wanting to learn and, and being open to new explorations and new materials and, um, you know, finding a balance there of, uh, you know, professionally, this is one thing I do. And also as an artist in another realm, I can give myself the space to explore and just be a student forever. Um, Cause I think, that's a mentality that I've developed that really came from my interdisciplinary practice. Um, and also just like developing the patience with, with myself to explore and to fail and see any like mistakes or failures as actually incredibly valuable uh, experiences that you know, I can carry with me back into the painting studio.
Do you have anything to add there? I know we've, we've talked a little bit yesterday about um, how you also have a background in ceramics. Um, is that something that you've experienced? Do you want me to come over with the mic, Louie? Yeah, screen the mic over. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> sorry. I got you. Um, well, let's see. Uh, yes, I, I, I also have a background where in the painting department, I wasn't able to um, actually for, for, for various reasons, the, the art department did, found that they didn't want to um, grant me the opportunity to paint as, as my emphasis. So I had to find my discipline uh, in the art field elsewhere in the department. So uh, there was an incredible sculptor who gave me a chance. And um, um, he was, his name was Durant Thompson, and he was, uh, he was sort of my um, savior in the art department to allow me to actually continue my BFA. And, um, and so for those reasons, I was also in, in the field of trying to do more interdisciplinary things. And I loved a lot of different departments. I loved the printmaking department love the sculpture department, but um, probably one of the ones that had in my heart was ceramics. Um, and it almost was my emphasis. I was probably one class away from emphasizing in that, but I stayed with, I stayed with sculpture because, um, well, he stuck with me in a time where, um, you know, I didn't know where my future as, as, a, as an art degree was going. So, um, but because of that, very similar to EVA, it, it allowed me to have a much more diversified understanding of the art, uh, med of other art mediums, and I only think it has helped advance my painting. And I, I always painted because that's how I made my living. I still was paying the bills doing portraiture. So for that reason, it, was, it worked out really, really well. I know people can't hear me to ask this question, but I'm really curious, do you still sculpt now? Is it like a leisure activity? Have, have you taken a big break from it? Like, would you ever like want to make sculptures to sell or have you already done it? I'm just super out of the loop. Well, I would love to, um, but considering um, East Oak Studio uh, keeps me very busy. So I, for that reason, I am unable to do all the things that I wished I could. Uh, so, um, would I want to? Absolutely. Um, I, at, at GCA, I, I did a lot of sculpting stuff when I was there, so I, I thoroughly enjoy it, and I th actually think that it really helps your form concept uh, st strengthen uh, as a painter. So really thinking about the world that we see and perceive as, as a sculptural world, as a three-dimensional world. Uh, actually is very, very, very beneficial to have that background. Um, don't think you have to have it, but it helps if you do. That's why uh, GCA tells you to, or it, part of the program is you have to go through um, at least one sculpture class. Uh, but I also think that's so that you, if you happen to find that you have a knack for sculpture and love it, it gives you the opportunity to to, to try it, you know, which I think is very important for everyone to kind of give that a go. I think there's, there's something to be said in there of, you know, regardless of what medium or material you're working with, as an artist, your most valuable material that you have is your time. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're in a position to be able to jump from one medium to another, and still allow that to be a good investment of your time, I'd say absolutely go for it. If you're in a position where that's not very feasible, you know, then you can develop a practice kind of like I have over the years of just like, well, I enjoy these other things and I am happy to do that in my free time on weekends or, you know, whatever, holidays. And, um, you know, and also just really respecting the time that you as an artist invest in your work. Um, I think, uh, yeah, 
Time is important. <laughs>
and I'm always envious and respectful of painters who really do have that answer in mind when they sit down to do their work. Um, it's just a craft and like act of creation that I have always loved and been drawn to. And I think the answer in some ways is just that simple, is that it's a way that I really love spending my time and Personally, there's like a moment, especially if I'm painting from a model or even if I'm like doodling and I'm working from imagination, I think that's probably a better example. And I've made some drawing error from drawing from reference or I have created a person out of my mind if I am just sketching from imagination. And there's this moment where I feel like I have made a person, not a living, breathing person, but I've like, I can imagine an entire story for this character in my head. Like, like I feel like the small God of this small world and there's something amazing about that. And I feel really privileged to have been able to study what I do for long enough that like that's where I can get in the act of creation. But I find that really addictive and I love it. And that is why I do what I do. Thank you. I'm there's so many thoughts running through my head right now and I'm just trying to figure out a way to organize them because there's so much to unpack <laughs> there, like in, in the question itself and then what you said. Um, like I think, I think a lot of painters are able to understand the world through the lens of painting and through the lens of their practice. And, um, oh gosh, I'm blanking on where I heard this the other day, but I heard, the other day I heard somebody say something to the effect of, you know, when humans are born as children, we're all innate artists. We, we all are artists at birth. Um, and you can see that in the way that, that children have the, um, just the impetus to create, to draw, to paint, to do whatever. Um, and there's, there's no fear about it. There's no, uh, fear of acceptance or fear of, uh, you know, critical, uh, reception or, or thinking there. And, um, they just do it. You know, it's, it's how children make sense of the world. And I think in, in that way, I find a really, um, beautiful childlike exploration and curiosity and um, hunger to create as an exploratory tool of just being a human being navigating this life. Um, and I think too, you know, when you think about, when you think about painting as a, painting as artifact and, and looking at art history and, um, you know, you can even go all the way back to Lascaux and like cave paintings and uh, petroglyphs. I think it's, um, it's an inherent human ability and it's a very unique human ability that we have to make art and to create in this way. Um, and I think, you know, by creating, whether it's painting or writing poetry or playing music or, you know, whatever, mm. whatever your creative thing is. Um, I think that just the creative pursuit in the larger sense of the, of the word really defines us as human beings and as a, a human civilization. Um, and it's not about finding answers. It's about asking them. Um, yeah, Louis, Louis always has a, a turn, turn of phrase that he uses um, where he describes tools of investigation, um, meaning like, 
well, I guess you can explain that if you'd like, but like, mm -hmm. you know, what, uh, what are you as an artist employing? What questions are you asking? What, what methods and tools are you using um, to develop a composition or, or approach a subject? And I think in the, the grander, more global sense of, of that phrase, tools of investigation, I think art is the singular tool of investigation. Um, yeah, do you wanna mm -hmm. expand That's on that, Louis? It's beautiful, it's great thoughts. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big proponent, in fact, Tina and I were talking about earlier that, you know, what is your why? Like when the days are hard and you're trying to create and you just are, you're, you, you need to have a strong understanding of why. And it could be anything, but uh, for me, there's a fair, several things that I feel like I, I've, I've thought a long time and very deeply about this subject. And I don't know if I necessarily have all the answers, um, but there are things that I feel like have allowed me to discover my why um, about it, and that's what I would share, which is, number one, you know, we are inherently innate to create. And that is in all, all forms, fashions, everything from um, poetry, philosophy, music. Um, we, we have an innate desire to want to say something and that, like you said, from the dawn of time, that has been uh, the case. Um, another thing is, is that I believe in the power of beauty. And I believe that beautiful things changes things. And there's so much ugliness in this world. And it is to our responsibility for the people that are altruistic and want to do good in this world to uh, inspire each other by creating beautiful things. And for each different person, that could be helping someone on the street. That could be, you know, um, buying someone a meal, or it could be a teacher in school. I mean, the most impactful people of my life, I don't remember who won the Nobel Prize six years ago, and I don't remember who won Miss America last year. But what I do remember is my teacher, who mm -hmm. had the most, most impact on my life. And um, for me, it is, it is about trying to, in one shape, way, or form, leave the world in a way that was better than when I found it. And for me, it's like if you've been given an inherent gift or a desire to do something, then um, I personally believe it is my responsibility to lean in and find a way to uh, use it to help somebody else have a better day. So. There is so much beauty in this world that, hey, I might not be able to make something as beautiful as a flower actually exists, but maybe I can draw your attention enough to stop your day to look at a painting that ends up being a window for you to realize how beautiful the miracle of a flower really is. Mm. And so, um, you know, we take for granted because we like love to eat bread and we might not see that bread very long, but. When I saw it at the store a few days ago, I was like, that is so beautiful. I want to paint that. Maybe it's worth somebody seeing just how beautiful it is, how that piece of bread came out, you know. So that's part of my purpose. That's part of what East Oaks is about. That's why we spend so much time devoting time to each other is because I believe it matters. And um, it's a way for me to leave the world a little bit better than when I came. Mm, that's beautiful. I think too, I found myself last night thinking about like, just the fact that we're painting this beautiful loaf of bread and like bread as a symbol, like what does bread symbolize to me? You know, it, it makes me think about all of the people across this world who don't have bread on their table, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and the fact that we get to sit here and not even, not even be eating yeah. or consuming it, we're painting it. Um, it's just an immense, immense privilege. Um, and I think it's very humbling um, to be able to sit here and paint this. Because, um, you know, not only can not everybody paint and, and uh, you know, 
practice a creative pursuit, but not everybody even has bread to begin with. And I think, um, you know, that's part of the beauty of art too, is like taking the time to appreciate the preciousness of something that isn't even your painting. It's not even your work that's precious. It's, it's what you're saying and what you're expressing and um, what you're focusing on. Uh, and the lived human experience behind it that's precious. Mm. One thing um, in this uh, connects with what we were saying, Evie, um, one thing that really motivates me when I'm painting is the fact that a painting can create this meditative space. It's a moment of quiet contemplation it, and that moment in and of itself is, is a beautiful thing. And so, I mean, one of my goals, like if you're kind of thinking of what ideally a beautiful painting that I could make, like what, what could I do? Like what is my kind of highest achievement? It would be to create that object that someone can kind of sit in front of and take time and space to have that kind of moment of contemplation. Because I think especially in uh, today's world with you know how much media we have uh, surrounding us and you know, the, how fast paced everything is, um, like it's just more and more to me important to have time to just sit with something for a long time and just be with it. <laughs> mm. um, and so that, that part motivates me to improve my skills, to create something beautiful. Um, and, and I think it's something that's really cool that art can do and just in general and outside of painting, I think any art practice can do that and painting is, is one of those things. Yeah, that's, that, that's beautiful. Oh, I love this conversation. <laughs> it's giving me some feelings, y'all. <laughs> Good vibes. Yeah, really, really powerful question. We have a question from Mustafa. He says, hi from Egypt, question for Erica. How do you find switching between site size and comparative and which one do you work with and more? So, um, I, I love site size because it's so efficient. <laughs> it's, <laughs> seriously, to be able to just have the thing and be able to look and compare, it's, it's great. Um, but it's not always feasible to do, uh, to set up your work or to set up, uh, you know, your studio that way, depending on your light or scale, you know, so many things. And so, um, I found it necessary to adapt to, you know, for example, right now I'm not working site size. Even, it's not quite. Yeah. And so, um, the, the flexibility that using comparative measurements gives you is really great. Um, but I love also the directness that um, site size has. And so uh, it's also a really efficient way to learn. Um, so I, I think it's a great tool as a student to, to start with, you know, really being able to compare something and seeing directly on your canvas how it relates is, is a really useful way of, of learning. Um, and so I, I find that now I mix the two just depending on how I, how I can set things up. And so this eucalyptus painting that I've been working on um, with roses, I did have the opportunity to use sight size and I was excited because I'm like, yes, I can, it's very comfortable for me to work that way. Um, but it's not always, uh, it's not always feasible. Do you want to oh, maybe should, just wait, I should oh, also add, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. I should also. I was just thinking. Um, there's something really cool about sight size, where how you observe something from different distances, optically, psychologically, you know, everything can inform uh, what you're putting into the painting and your decisions. And so there's something that's really cool about uh, 
the process of sight size and how you're observing and how it can inform your painting. Um, that, uh, that, that kind of carries back to my education at Florence Academy. And so when I can set things up like that, um, I'm always excited to do that. Do you want to maybe give a um, quick description of, of the differences between sight size and comparative, just for if anybody listening isn't familiar with those methods? Sure. So sight size, long story short, is basically setting uh, your panel next to the setup so that you are creating a one-to-one -one scale um, representation of your subject. And so um, you can set it up so that way you could literally take you know, maybe a plumb line or a straight edge or something and, and go across and be able to connect, for example, where this vase sits on the table, you can go horizontally and visually or optically, the vase would be sitting on the same level. And so you can um, measure where things are placed at, as a tool of observation. Um, and just visually, it helps your memory to be able to observe something and then compare it and it's because it's a one-to-one -one, uh, scale and in comparison. You have it literally next to the tech, next to the subject. Um, and so, uh, depending on your scale, for example, if I wanted to do something that literally was life size in, in, and set up site size, I would put it right next to this table. So that way, um, I would literally match it. And then if I wanted something smaller, I would pull my easel forward like this, um, where my scale is a bit smaller than, than life size. So that's in general. I'm trying to come up with something on the fly and <laughs> making sure that it's oh, yeah. <laughs> descriptive enough, but. <laughs> we also have some people in the chat answering the um, question from Andre about like, why do you paint? And Jose says, I paint to create. I like building things too. I'm not sure what my ultimate goal is yet, searching is part of the fun and then Christine also answered and they say painting lets me share with others something beautiful in a way that gives them a moment of serenity and appreciation for our world also with the world in such chaos painting lets me create a world that I can control and make hopefully beautiful mm. Love it. Do you want mine? No. I just appreciate the audience being able to feel free to share their opinions and hearts and values too. This is a bit of a turn from this conversation, but the fact... Okay, e Evie has it. Okay. The huh? fact that I feel alone in painting this bottle of olive oil, I feel like is <laughs> an injustice because nice. I really want someone to bail me out and help me figure out how on earth people paint glass. Well, Chelsea, we have a great video called Painting for <laughs> Painting Glass. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Boom. I'll have to watch it during the break. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I've, I've painted and drawn glass before, but I actually don't know that I've ever painted or drawn glass that is like containing a colored liquid. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, <it's> tricky. <laughs> I'm finding, like I understand the importance of keeping the edges in this hard, but this is such a small part of the composition and my canvas is textured enough that I, feel like I am fighting very hard to um, actually like make sure the glass doesn't look frosty or actually that I look like I'm actually capturing what I'm capturing considering how translucent that is. Um, and I don't have a lot of like boundary edges. I have like internal edges of the shapes, um, but it's difficult to actually show where the top and bottom and sides of this bottle are. 
Yeah, Chelsea, I'll be curious to take a peek at how you're approaching it because I think it's such a um, it's such a finicky thing to paint just because you know if you shift your gaze just ever so slightly it's mm -hmm. completely different. Yeah, the whole um, drawing moves. Yeah, I feel like the bottle that I'm painting is very different from the bottle that you're painting, you know? Yeah. Well, and I, I think it's a different challenge because yours is a small portion. Um, yeah. Yeah, and like it's going to ask to be simplified um, for better or for worse. We have another comment from Mustafa in regards to the site size conversation. Um, he says, but site size is so tiring. One steps back to look, steps forward to put a brush stroke and step back. Oh darn, I will lose 20 pounds in one painting. <laughs> Subject, I think that there's, um, the, the opportunity of improving your visual memory is there too, because you're memorizing what something looks like, where it is on your canvas, making the mark, and, and that whole process is, is like every, every time you make a stroke, you um, are improving your visual memory, which is kind of a fun side kind of benefit. Um, but it, the opportunity as well is because you do have to stand back every time, it really helps you to observe your work as a whole and not get so sucked into a detail and then step, step back and be like, oh no, like, you know, these relationships don't work or, you know, I, I painted a beautiful eye, but it's, you know, three centimeters to the left, you know, that kind of thing. And so having to step back all the time and really observe the big impression and kind of optical effects or, you know, a lot of things there so many opportunities in, in, in that method. I actually have like multiple post-it notes taped to my easel that continually remind me to step back because I think it's so helpful and I always forget. I use post-it notes sometimes as well. <laughs> I think somebody was asking like, how can you maintain focus on, or you know, helping your focus on, on the things that you need to do. I do write a lot of notes to myself. Um, I remember in school, a lot of my easels were full of notes just written on the side of boards as I was getting critiques on drawings and you know, making sure that I was you know, doing what I needed to do. <laughs> when, I don't know if I've ever told you this, Louie, but um, so when I first got involved with the East Oaks, I was actually an uh, online mentee of Louis, and um, back in those days, uh, I would have, um, you know, we'd be video chatting and I would have a notepad off screen and I would just write down little nuggets of wisdom that, that he would tell me and um, yeah, and I have that at home. Oh, I took copious notes as a student, yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> every, every, in fact, it was a really useful tool for um, understanding how much I understood from a critique. If I could rewrite it and understand what they were telling me, then my understanding was clearer and I could, you know, apply what they were teaching and I understood. But if I, you know, got to a point where I'm like, wait, does it, do I, I can't, re I don't know what they said or I can't remember or, or um, you know, something doesn't make sense, you know, then it was like, okay, great, I can ask, you know, relevant questions to to what I need to learn and improve on. I know there's something about art where sometimes I feel like students um, are, don't feel like they, like note taking would be helpful because for whatever reason, I don't know. Um, but I, yeah, I would encourage, I would encourage it. <laughs> Oh, this bottle. <laughs> <laughs> why, yes, oh why? You must suffer with me. <laughs> no. Yeah, please do so you can come bail us out. Yeah. <laughs> Help. It's fun though. I'm, 
even if it doesn't turn out in a way that I'm happy with, I'm enjoying the, the process of, yeah, <laughs> of trying to figure it out. It really is a search. Um, just because it's such a unique, uniquely complicated um, subject. <laughs> I was just thinking the same. That, like, I was looking at this and I was like, man, I don't know how to solve this problem, but it's really cool to be painting something that like represents that degree of unknown. Yeah, absolutely. I think after you paint like one subject for a long time and you really like learn the ins and outs of it, there's something exciting about being able to come to something that can just knock you on your ass. <laughs> Yeah, I find sometimes even the best works that you're the most happy with are really just the result of a number of collective stumbles. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes it pays off and sometimes it doesn't, and that's okay. And I will attempt to remind myself of that <laughs> in, in 30 minutes. <laughs> I, d I took out things from this one. <laughs> the little yeah. like uh, charcuterie, cutlery. Yeah, I, yeah. I they are not in here. <laughs> <laughs> Design choices. Yeah. I went ahead and tried to put in, uh, from my perspective, the one of the garlic bulbs is like hiding right behind the bottle, and I considered just editing that out. And I went ahead and I'm trying to do it, and I kind of regret trying to do it. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like it's it's tricky because you have to like take into account the transmission of the oil and the glass and like you have to basically re-simulate it. Whereas, you know, if you took out the eucalyptus, simulating what the linen is behind it is like a much simpler thing. Mm -hmm. Part of, um, part of what I enjoy about not only just this uh, painting from life and, and, and these nights or just in general about painting is like all of that strategizing and problem solving, like puzzle decoding, you know, all of that uh, is, is really engaging. So one of, one of the, you know, to carry on to that question of why do you paint, well, the act of doing it is just really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like one of the key things that happens when you've been doing something like this long enough is that you, so much of this becomes automatic enough that you free up a lot of brain space and it, it gives you the opportunity to look at a mistake you just made and say like, yeah, I have the mental bandwidth to solve that problem. I was just like painting I was trying to paint in the holder for the cap of the bottle on the oil. Mm -hmm. And I just ran through some paint I had already put down and it did not cooperate. Like I lifted paint off, the stroke was uncontrolled. And the fact that I am painting something new meant that I was like, duh, I give up. Whereas if that had happened in a portrait, I would know exactly how to like persist and see my way through to correcting it. And I think that's something that artists who are like earlier on their journey 
don't often appreciate. It's not so much that we like have a magic touch or there's like a magic technique that they are missing. It's simply that like the longer you do this, the faster you catch yourself making mistakes and the more confident you are in your ability to fix them. Um, because what I'm running into is a mistake that I could solve 10 times over in a portrait and not bat an eye. And on this, it's enough to like, not totally demoralize me because I'm not over here like weeping, but it's, it's frustrating. And there was a moment of like, oh, I don't know if I should even paint this thing. Yeah, I think also, you know, the more, the more you paint, the more comfortable you get with struggle. Um, oh yeah, you gotta get comfortable with that. Yeah. I had a professor in college who said something to me that has stuck with me for many, many years. Um, something to the effect of, in order to be an artist, you have to love the tedium. And I think that that's, that's really valuable to think of in terms of like the tedium of, of just work and just waking up every day and getting to it and like getting it done. Um, and also the tedium of, of, you know, repeatedly just making mistakes and making mistakes and, um, you know, learning to enjoy that process. We have another question from Mustafa. He says, without mentioning the instructor, have you ever heard a no-no, like never use a blending stump or something like that? Because this is a riff off the question, but I did have an instructor in college who um, did not agree with the atelier form of teaching. And he would advise students to not go that route as to not be pigeonholed. So is there any like kind of advice that an instructor has given you where you're just kind of like, mm, no, I don't think so. I had a professor in college who, um, if during a critique, if you said the word juxtaposition, <laughs> you would, you would be m marked down a full grade level. So like your A would be a B. Um, and <laughs> At the time when he first said that, a lot, of, a lot of the students just thought that he was joking and it became very clear uh, that he was not. Um, and I think honestly that that was really brilliant because, you know, in, in so doing, he was challenging the students to um, try to articulate themselves using a language that was more unfamiliar and yet more descriptive. Um, and I think that, that that was a very, very valuable no-no that I learned. <laughs> I like that. Uh, was, the, was the question di directed towards something you learned off of the no-no, or was it, direct, was it one that's like they're trying to say that this is a truth in, in actuality it was something that you didn't feel like was or still don't? It was like, what's something that they said never to do, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and he's also asking like, what's the most stupid no-no that a professor has ever told you to not do? <laughs> Had an atelier instructor tell us that we weren't allowed to look at art outside of what he showed us because we wouldn't be able to be good artists. What? <gasps> yeah. That's terrible. Yeah. Oh, wow. So I think I might know where that one instructor <laughs> came from, Mustafa, oh. who like warned you against the atelier. Probably, um, probably had some experience in line with that one. Uh, I, I feel like the one that comes to my mind is uh, don't never use black <laughs> yeah. oh i yeah i had that too you know a lot and there's so many people that really just adhere to that and uh, black is such a useful color if you know how to use it and i get the reason why they tell people is because most people misuse it 
or improperly use it. But um, it's just a neutral blue. And so like, there's so many opportunities to use a neutral blue that can be helpful. So that's one. Yeah, that's I can't really think of anything. That's good. A lot less scarring. Or, or maybe I just, <laughs> maybe I just ignored it <laughs> and blocked it out. I don't know. I mean, I wasn't told never to use the paper stump, but I was guided to not use it, or that in the brush, like you know, brushing over your stuff. Mm. Um, and it's something I repeated to students, but again, with a disclaimer of like, it's not saying that you can never use the paper stump or it's not like that. It's just, um, if whenever you, you might receive feedback like that, there's always a reason why. Um, and in my experience, it was don't use the paper stump on this drawing because try to use your, uh, cross-hatching, your mark making to create a soft edge rather than an, like a, a tool to kind of blend it without specificity. So you're being more deliberate with how to soften something. And so, you know, and being really specific with your edge quality and how you can handle your materials in order to um, create soft edges. Because um, there's always structure even if it's soft. Um, and so, but in that case, it wasn't like, you're never allowed to use the tool. It was like, you know, it was a learning situation where that was the kind of like, kind of like when you were not allowed to use the word juxtaposition, you ha it forced you to use other ways of communication and using other vocabulary. Oh, absolutely. Um, and so it was part of, of that uh, process. So. Yeah, I think that's a really, great uh, clarification like you know I think I think the whole like don't look at other art thing I'm sorry that's that's, so that's, extreme. that's terrible um, but I think that you know it is good to clarify that like if somebody uh, instructs you to work within certain parameters that are are limiting um, questioning why mm -hmm. um, yeah I think that's really really crucial Erica when you were teaching at Florence did you ever have assignments that were, were for your students kind of like, okay, we're gonna work within these specific limits? Um, we would use uh, a limited palette. We would use, it was, I mean, it was basically what we were doing in, when I was a student. Um, we were teaching similar projects. So um, things like limited palette. And, and again, I would discourage while the students were there, um, to not use the paper stump and the brush for their drawings. Um, but again, un with provided that they understood that there was a reason behind it for this moment. I, I always gave the like disclaimer of, <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm not saying never ever to use the tool. It's just understanding like when to use it and then when to put it down. Like that's ultimately what it was, was you know, maybe you use the brush for example to help um, put in the graphite or charcoal into the paper because you want a unified, uh, like the grains to be filled in a nice uh, way. But then knowing when after that's done, set the tool down and, and use your, your hatching now to, to um, create the, the effect that you're going for. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, other limitations, I mean, I, I feel like most of it was just, we're using, it, you know, with, with the six weeks course, which is what I taught, um, you know, of course you're, t you're learning site size and you're learning um, with charcoal and those kinds of materials. So it was very you know, connected to what we were doing at Florence Academy, of course. So um, I don't know if it's necessarily connected to the question. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the limitations of the curriculum is just what it, because it was the school. Yeah, I think I want to see like I don't know if there's like videos of your lessons or something. <laughs> yeah, your students are lucky to have had you. 
Thanks, guys. As we are lucky for being able to be here. Actually, yeah. Good. Yeah. We have another comment from Mustafa regarding the blend the blending stump being a no no. Um, he says blending stumps by some professors here is prohibited. Better to be caught with drugs instead. Less penalty. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a line in the Harold Speed drawing book, The Practice and Science of Drawing, and he just, he hates the paper stump. <laughs> I think he, there's, there's some sort of line, I can't remember what it was, but it made me laugh. Because he was passionate about not using it. <laughs> no! And we have a really good question from Antietti. Um, they say, any advice on painting walls? I notice a temperature shift that happens that I can't achieve. How to keep the warm and cool separate and make the walls of a room feel like they're under the same light? That's actually a really good question. Mm -hmm. you all have experience painting walls? I don't know if this is exactly connected with, I don't, for example, if you're painting an interior, maybe this is not relevant, but I was actually always told, for example, if you're painting a portrait and you have a background, not to think of it like painting a wall, but instead thinking of it like painting the atmosphere or the space between the subject and the wall, like thinking of it as air behind and, and that. But if you're painting an interior, then that is not relevant <laughs> or less relevant. The drawing um, that I have just about finished that I've been working on uh, for the last several weeks took a very long time because I had to draw in a large wall space behind my subject. Um, and it, you know, it really impressed, um, again, on the power of flatness, but also the power of very delicately and carefully capturing the way that light floods across a flat surface, depending on the angle it's hitting. Um, and really, you know, trying to express the light existing within the atmosphere between the wall and you, if that makes any sense. Um, yeah, it seems like it would be a straightforward thing. It's, it's really not. I'm painting a wall right now because I'm working on a figurative piece in front of a wall and something that Louis said that's really been helpful is to just think about how the light falls on the wall and because light is so relative to color temperature and how that will shift it's kind of a really good way to step back and just ask yourself where is the light hitting where are the shadows and how does that react to the color and just kind of just take a step back and really assess the shadows, the lights, and just the way the light is actually hitting the wall can be really helpful.
And then Vicky Sullivan says that um, Raymond Hurt Hurtado, which I think I have heard of this person, has some YouTube videos about the history of drawing and he covers who used the stump and shows many examples of with and without the stump and the different progressions of drawing. Yeah, Ramon's work is incredible. I'm a big, big fan of his stuff. I love how controversial the stump is. <laughs> okay, so this is, I'm going to chime in on the stump. <laughs> what are your and thoughts? And the wall. <laughs> I've been without the, the mic for a second, so I'm get, getting back in here. Um, so on the stump, one of the things that I love is that back in the day, the old masters, do you all know it? Uh, I'm, I bet I almost can guarantee Erica <laughs> knows. So Erica, you disqual you're disqualified to answer, oh. okay? Because I know I know Miss Historian over there knows what it is. But do any of you others know what they use as an eraser? As an eraser? Mm -hmm. Oh, bread. I know. I've heard bread. Yeah. Yes, they used bread. I saw Erica over there squirming, it's like, <laughs> like, I know like Hermione, Green, <laughs> Hermione Granger at the, uh, in, in, in class, sticking her hand up. Pick me, pick me. Although, funnily um, enough, I actually learned that um, from watching the Great British Bake Off. <laughs> did you? Really? <laughs> they, oh, they wow. They mentioned that That's during so one episode. I was like, oh, whoa. Yeah. Yep, yep. Pretty cool. So, my, um, shoot, I'm not mic'd, but my fun fact that someone can reiterate um, if Tina can't hear me, oh, you're fine. Um, my fun fact is that the name for rubber, the material, mm -hmm. comes from the fact that you rubbed erasers. So the material is named for the act of erasing mm -hmm. rather than vice versa. Which is awesome. Mm -hmm. Or is Love that from it. a James Gurney video? And James Gurney, if no one knows, y'all should go to Gurney Journey's blog. He, he's a wealth of information and a really great blog. Um, you can learn a lot from that. Um, but my point being is, is the old masters use bread to erase. Who's to tell you you can or cannot use <laughs> paper stumps to be able to push, you know, the material around? So one of my favorite stories is um, uh, Everett Kinsler was a, a famous portrait painter and painted, you know, countless presidents and uh, senators and congressmen and, uh, you know, uh, painted John Wayne and, and Catherine Hepburn. And anyway, he was out at a workshop and every time he'd pick up a brush, he, he had one attendee who would be like, what, what brush are you using now? What, what, you know, what is this? What, what, what are you doing now? And he, after a while, after about two days of it, he, he kind of got fed up about her asking about each brush. And um, he turned around and he said, Madam, go grab me a stick and I'll paint with a stick. <laughs> and just a, a good lesson of, um, it doesn't matter necessarily what you paint with, it's what's in your mind. It does matter in the sense that it does give a particular maybe texture or evidence of, but usually you're at the beginning stages of what you're doing, um, it's gonna matter less um, typically, you know, there's caveats to all of this, but, um, but if, if, if a drawing stump might be all you have available to you, you know, um, and so, or maybe you just have a piece of bread or maybe you have a piece of bread and that's okay. You use that bread. I'm really afraid now that Louie's going to make us do drawing studies mm -hmm. using this bread. Yep. <laughs> yep. This bread is going to have another life. Oh, no. <laughs> Watch out, everyone. We also have a comment from Christine Long, um, which is kind of funny because we were just talking about Vermeer earlier. Um, but she says, I like the way Vermeer painted light falling on walls from shadow to strong light. Oh, walls, yes. Um, that reminds me, that's, that's a great point. Vermeer would be an excellent person to, to look and glean from as far as painting walls. But as long as, this is to dovetail off what Tina was saying, with, as long as you are creating a consistent gradient, but also thinking about the, the color of your light source, saying it's outside and it's the golden hour, 
and that is hitting your wall and your wall is a white wall. Um, it's going to go from warm to cool as a soft gradient across um, the wall. And as long as you paint a really consistent um, nature to it and a flatness to it, you can actually mimic a really interesting effect um, of your wall. Now, if you look at Vermeer, there's all sorts of also warms and cools and play with, with color. And as long as your value is right, you can play with the color. Doesn't really matter. So um, I wish Alex was here because he has done phenomenal paintings of interiors and utilizing walls because he would be a great person to, to really um, talk about this a lot. But sometimes it can be very difficult even when you know what you're doing. <laughs> Alex, you should text in. Yeah, literally phoning a friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hold on, everybody. I know a guy. Let me just make a call. We have a question from Christine, and this is something I think we all struggle with sometimes. Um, any tips for getting both sides of a vase to be exactly the same shape? Mm. The mirror. Use the mirror to help you observe. You know, stepping back using the mirror um, can help you give a fresh eye on what you're looking at. And I find that um, a really useful tool for painting things that the longer you stare at them the less uh, clear your uh, process becomes and so that's a really useful tool for um, for just you know double checking your drawing but you know painting man-made objects you know stepping back and double checking those uh, using the mirror is really helpful do you primarily use the mirror for um, checking drawing or checking value? I use the mirror for everything. <laughs> <laughs> I use it seriously though for um, checking the drawing, for seeing my work um, as an abstract uh, kind of combination of shapes and seeing you know how things are flowing. I'll, I'll flip it upside down and see what's happening with the light effect. I'll check it from a fresh eye for drawing, like we were saying before. And um, it really is just a useful, really, really useful tool. I'll use my phone as a black mirror because it compresses all of the detail and light into um, your kind of major light and shadow masses and colors are muted. So you're finding for me what's most essential in a, uh, in a piece or in, in your setup, when it really helps when you are uh, drawing or painting and you know, helping, helping you observe those things. Um, and then I'll use just the normal mirror um, for color and composition, you know, things like that. Drawing, again. A really great craft project if anybody wants to make a black mirror for themselves. Um, Go to the thrift store or dollar store, wherever, buy a super cheapo picture frame and take out the, the glass from the frame and flip it over and spray paint the back of it black. Can you talk a little bit about like, what the black mirror is and what its use would be versus a traditional mirror? So, uh, yeah, so I, um, I use the black mirror. Um, I mean, I use, I use both and I feel like any, anytime you use anything, it's good. Um, but I use the black mirror, uh, for understanding those big, uh, light shapes and understanding the big effect. It's really useful. For example, actually, if you're plein air painting, because there's so much information and if you want to understand the, the essence, like the big effect, you can look at your, uh, setup through, uh, or your subject, uh, using a black mirror. Um, 
because it just compresses all of those things and, and you're only really seeing the big light shapes and big shadow shapes, um, kind of those essentials for design. Um, and then the, the white or the white mirror, the uh, normal mirror is useful for drawing, it's useful for color and a fresh eye. And I think that you can use either one in any situation, um, but the black mirror is really useful for, for example, what I was saying before, like if you have something like this setup, for example, if there's a lot of light and I wanna understand what is like my value relationships, my, my big ones, I can look in the mirror and whatever stands out to me in my, um, in my drawing, and I'll flick my eye and compare to the setup and I'll make sure that, you know, flicking my eye back and forth, um, you know, things that need to come forward will, or, the, or if they need to be lighter or darker, it's just really useful for, for checking that. Again, uh, the black mirror kind of gets rid of all of the kind of excess color and detail. So you're only seeing uh, the big picture. And the longer we stare at something and, and really observe, like it's hard to get that fresh eye again. It's e really easy to like get into the details and lose your sense of the uh, larger effect of, of light or you know, your, your values. For example, the longer we stare at something, the more values we see. Um, this is really common, for example, if you're painting an eye and you want like the darkest dark and the lightest light and the eye socket and you can see all the reflected light and so you end up having like a really wide range of values in something that's actually tucked underneath bone so they're, it's actually you know, more compressed and opportunity to, for unifying some things. And so all of this, of course, is dependent on your, on your light situation, but um, the black mirror helps show how compressed things actually are. Have you ever used um, something like tinted glass for looking for values? I personally have not, no. I, I think the mirror has really been the only kind of extra tool that I've used uh, in my own work. And when do you like to use um, either mirror mm -hmm. versus just stepping back and squinting? Um, I kind of rotate my tools. So kind of every so often I'll try to just step back and look at the whole thing or I'll, like, whenever I'm painting I'll just squint to make sure that I'm compressing uh, and well, and then I'll just kind of, I don't know, every, every maybe 10 minutes or something, I'll, I'll just step back and use the mirror to make sure that whatever I'm painting is doing the thing that I think it's doing. Especially useful for portraits to, to see like if I'm painting something and I step back and I use the mirror, making sure that the drawing is doing what I think it's doing. So, or what I hope it, it will do. <laughs> It's so easy to step back and use the mirror and then you'll see like, oh, I need to change my horizon line or, oh, my proportions are off or, you know, big stuff like that and end up um, like those are the kinds of things that the mirror is really helpful for um, checking. Such great conversation tonight. <laughs> Now that you just said that, <laughs> we're all yeah. silent. Dead silent. It was the curse. You jinxed it. We have another question from Antienti. This might be a tricky one, and I'm trying to think of how to like phrase this because Erica, when you said that you look through like your phone as like a black mirror, it helps you kind of see the shapes. Mm -hmm. um, and they are asking, what do you mean when you mention shapes like maybe like thinking maybe the contour or how would you define that um, I'm looking at primarily light shapes and shadow shapes so as an example I'm looking at you know this bowl here and I if I squint down I see that there's this big kind of what is that trapezoid <laughs> uh, shape here of the light and then there's this little triangle here of the shadow shape, um, just looking at the bowl. And so you can see that kind of unified shape when you squint, it's that the separation of the light shape and the shadow shape. 
You can see it if you're looking through the black and white. Hey, that I'm, it's good for electronics to do that. Um, if I use my black mirror, it helps compress it so that I'm not zooming in on the details and seeing the little speckly bits and the highlight and like, you know, the uh, texture, the, you know, all of those, those beautiful details that I will put in, but understanding their larger context. Um, you could also think of shapes like the whole background being a, being a shape. You can look at how the light hits this uh, pumpkin here or the, what is it, the gourd, gourd yes, squash thing how that is a light shape, how everything here is a light shape, and how like all of these shapes are just big masses of, of value. Um, and same thing with shadow, like you can find how these all unify into, into a shape that you can kind of make a really interesting design with. And so, and that uh, connects with what we were talking about yesterday with compression and finding how things group together value-wise where you know, maybe my, my darkest bits, my value 10, 9, and 8, maybe I can group all of that into one value shape. And, and, and if I design that accurately, then it can read as it being shadow, and then the leftover shapes can read as light. And so um, those kind of essences of, of the design underneath the painting. So maybe you see all the detail and stuff, but the kind of underneath all of that, that structure, uh, that value structure, design structure, is what I'm looking for. And then, you know, the longer I paint on something, you know, more details I add, more color, more val like value shifts, I want to make sure that the big picture still reads, that, you know, as I start to add highlights here on this bowl, or you know, details, or I get into different colors and accents that, for example, this reflected light that I'm putting in, I want to make sure that it still sets uh, into in space correctly and so I don't want to overdo the reflected light because then my shadow shape won't read or and as well my light shape won't read as well hopefully that was clear that was awesome yeah, yeah. <laughs> go girl <laughs> Eric is Jane on the spot tonight <laughs> these are really tricky concepts um it's hard to, it's hard to, like you can read it in a book, but it's hard to understand it um, if you don't have a visual kind of corresponding and really pointing out what these things are and then seeing them in different situations, like it takes time. Mm -hmm. I, I found as a student, it took me a long time to, to understand what these terms meant and then I found like different people had a different way of describing um, different concepts and and so it, it just took some time. So if you feel, if you feel frustrated um, as you try to understand these things, like be patient with yourself because they're kind of tricky. <laughs> when I first started here um, in person back over the summer, um, in my sketchbook, I literally started writing down a glossary of terms for myself. Yeah. Um, just to try to like help program them, you know, in my, in my conscious mind as I was working. Um, and honestly, it really, really helped. So if, if anybody's in that position, I highly, highly recommend make yourself a little glossary, uh, refer to it like, you know, every morning when you go in the studio and every, every evening when you're leaving and um, it'll just do a good job of really hammering in a lot of this in your mind. A big part of my learning at Florence Academy was learning the vocabulary and just, um, particularly first year, that's what, that was kind of my biggest lesson learned from first year was, was just the vocabulary. We have um, Jolene who says, I look forward to this every month. Thank you for making this all possible, which is very sweet. And then we also have a um, Tom Figarelli who has no relation to me at all. Uh, <laughs> says, hi, everyone. I hope I didn't miss much. Just joined. I really like it. Great. Well, we're glad you're here, Mr. No Relation Tom Figarelli. That's sweet.
How's everybody doing? I want to sit down. <laughs> Does there, would everyone like to take a, a quick sort of still life break? That might be good. Yeah, I healthy. could use some. All right, everyone. We're going to take eyes. like a five, uh, five to ten minute break, um, just to kind of get ourselves to, um, you know, oil our our joints, and we and we are back, everyone. Also, to over iterate, uh, just for anyone who didn't hear earlier, we right now have a East Oak Studio sale going on. The link will be in the description in the show notes. Um, and you can click on it to see what is still available. We have all of our, a lot of our painting from life videos up there. Um, no, 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 videos, uh, paintings. <clears throat> and that's what happens when I try to do two things at once. Um, get things mixed up. But um, anyway, so uh, check that out. They make great Christmas gifts. And all the funds go to help support the artists that are here and for East Oaks to keep doing these things. So uh, we always appreciate your patronage. I'm going to ask this question because I know Erica has a great answer, but is there a favorite art metaphor that you've heard? <laughs> like metaphor for like, when you're teaching, like I've, I've heard, I've heard some interesting uh, metaphors um, and critiques during my school days. Um, one of my trying to think of some, I'm trying to choose which one. Um, I had a, I heard a teacher say, uh, when talking about like edges and having a variety of edges and like the dither and like some soft, some sharp and kind of that vibration that you might see. Um, talking about it like having bees in a mummy suit what? <laughs> Which I just really enjoyed. Bees in a mummy suit. I love it. So that's one favorite. Isn't there like a strawberry one that? Oh yeah, going uh, strawberry picking with a gun. Um. <laughs> See, this is so good. Love that. That one was like basically not being subtle. <laughs> Have any of you heard interesting descriptions during your own education? <laughs> well, I was, I was telling y'all, you know, they weren't descriptions of that, but me and my buddies, you know, and fun, is, the funny thing is, is it was when I was living in Italy, so <laughs> it must be an Italian thing that happens. Uh, but we were, we were just coming across, we had a buddy who was like a, a real good old boy and um, he would always have odd sayings. And so we decided we'd start making up our own odd sayings that just made absolutely no sense. <laughs> and. Um, it reminds me of that, like going strawberry picking with a gun thing, but we would say things like, oh man, that's just like fishing in a cornfield. <laughs> you know, that's just like a Sasquatch sitting on a, to uh, sitting on a to toadstool. But it, maybe I can uh, actually talk <laughs> and say it right. That's just like a bumblebee uh, typing on a typewriter. C 
See, for some reason, Louis, when you're when you're saying these, I'm hearing them in a southern accent. That's probably because I'm saying it in a southern accent. <laughs> <laughs> but Man. Just, like a bumblebee typing on a typewriter. Man, that's just like like fishing in a cornfield. I really hope my buddy Steve Strickland's listening. He's also an artist. He is an instructor at the um, at a university down in uh, Fairhope, Alabama. He was my fellow painter in Italy. We go out and plein air paint together. Louis, do you want to share your thoughts about how you're like building this bread right now? Yeah. So, um, one of the, like, I think the real joys of painting is, is, uh, trying to like lay down color and then try to discover what some of the, you know, we were talking about saturated, how hard it is to like, is it harder to find saturated uh, color or is it harder to find more subtle? color in, as far as painting and I would agree that it both have their challenges um, right now I'm having fun with trying to play with this bread texture of like the powdered flour on top with like the warm quality and nature of the cooked bread and uh, trying to find the the color relationships that are happening with the bread that also are in relationship to the bowl. And, um, and, but also keeping sort of this textural nature to it that feels very uh, craggy in its surface. So lots and lots of fun. But right now I think I should probably put some of this, a little bit of this um, cloth that's on top because context is would help with getting it a bit right. So Gone on quiet on me now. As if we were fishing in a cornfield. <laughs> I'm gonna have some weird fever dream about that now. Yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs> I have a question for you, Louis. Um, if slash how has your time living in the American South affected your work? Wow. Um, well, I would, I definitely, I mean, it most certainly has because um, the reason I'm probably painting today is due to a, a dear uh, painter by the name of Jason, uh, Marshall Bolden. And he was a pretty known painter. He was a very known painter in the, in the South, but um, relatively known um, nationally. He did like Nixon's children's portraits and uh, several, you know, politicians and things like that. But um, he was very dear friends with my grandfather and my family. And his son ended up being a, a portrait painter as well. And he won the grand prize um, in 2000 or 2001. Mm. And so uh, I grew up wanting to be an artist because of, of him. And he 
came from a similar background. His dad was a cotton farmer as well, and he didn't want to farm. And uh, I grew up working on our farm and knew that I didn't want to farm. <laughs> um, and, um, and so I always wanted to be an artist. My parents were really big into the arts. And so I don't know if the South itself had um, much to do with it because the appreciation for it was there was a tradition of portraiture in the South, but there wasn't necessarily like um, a lot of opportunity to learn in the South uh, for painting. However, it did affect some of my art making period um, because a lot of my earlier work when I was in, at the university was based off of my Southern experience. My grandfather was really big in the civil rights movement and, um, you know, we were growing up, we, we worked in the fields with all the workers' hands because my dad wanted us to be very involved with um, the African-American community and make sure that we um, understood what real labor felt like, felt like and appreciate them for what they were also doing. And so that was not conventional. And, growing up and so I, I painted a lot um, and created a lot of art based off of that mm. experience um, and uh, of working in the in the fields with them and um, so that, that I would say it, it influenced my work a lot in my earlier years with that um, but yeah you know I think that there's a, a a, a strong tradition of things down in the south and I do think that there's like more of a love for it than say up north because there's a modernism really plays a much larger role in in the north and they don't see as much value in in um, representational art so for that and for that reason I think that it it was important for me that we create something in the south because it's there's plenty of, of communities in the north and yet the the market it doesn't have as much of an appetite for it but there is an appetite for it in the south and yet there's not a community in the south for what we do so uh, that's how it's also influenced is we came to the south to try to found that um, a, a new thing that what we wished were here or I wished it was here when I was in my formative years, so. Yeah, that's amazing. And we have a comment from Christine Long. I think this is in relation to Evie's olive oil because I think she's the only one that has it blocked in yet. Um, but she says the olive oil looks great. Thank you so much. That's Look at really that. Sweet. See, it was worth doing. Aww. I really appreciate that. Evie, what about you? You grew up in the South. Yeah. Um, Do you feel it's had a big impact on your art making? Kind of similarly. Um, my decision to um, go to art school and, and pursue art, you know, professionally as a career um, was really made possible through the, the support of my family. Um, I was blessed to have an incredibly supportive family growing up who who always encouraged me to keep keep making art, keep doing it. Um, and you know, not everybody has that, and I think that was a really crucial uh, element of my childhood that allowed me to to stick with it. Mm. Um, and also, my uh, my high school art teacher. Um, really was an incredible influence on me. Um, she is a professional artist as well, and 
you know, always pushed me to, to keep moving forward no matter, you know, no matter what struggle or, you know, what life has in store for you. Um, just keep going. And, um, yeah, I'm, hopefully I'm, I'm making her proud. You know, I really look up to the teachers that I've been blessed to have in my life. And, you know, this is certainly no exception. Mm. Um, oh. just very fortunate to, to be here and learn. Um, but yeah, Ann Bepler, if you're out there listening, got lots of love for you. But I think too, like culturally, culturally growing up in the South, um, I think there is, there is a reverence for creativity and for art in, in our area um, that you know, is honestly just kind of infectious. Um, growing up in, in Durham, North Carolina, um, you know, there's a lot of public art. There's a lot of uh, resources for artists. Um, there's a lot of music. Um, and in a city that is so widely lauded for its, uh, you know, technology and medicine and, um, you know, all these really amazing and, and intense fields, um, it's really incredible to also have a very active, uh, pronounced art scene. Um, and so I think in that way, living in the South has really, really been a healthy thing um, just because of the community that, that we exist in. Yep. I think for, you know, for anybody out there that's listening who maybe feels like they don't have an immediate, you know, creative community in their, in their physical presence. Um, I think it's awesome that you're here tuning in because, you know, that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. It really is. And if you want to thrive as an artist, find people that are like-minded that are as passionate as you are, because it'll really make a difference in you uh, making it sustainable for yourself. Erica, do you have anything to add? I know. We, I mean, we Erica and I are the people in the South too. You know, the resident natives. So is Chelsea. <laughs> and Chelsea, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whole crew. Yeah. Do you guys feel any like specific influence from from growing up in the South, or does that affect you in a way? I think. There's a lot of, I think the nature here is mm. probably what I connect to most being here. Um, we ha like just in North Carolina, we have um, just such variety and there's something about how nature and art and finding you know, different connections there and, and how things are celebrated. Um, and painting, I think there's, there's just, there's something there <laughs> with, mm. with that kind of indirect inspiration. Um, so I, but I mean, if people know that I went to Italy for my education, I think probably most of my, I'd say my biggest inspirations have been my travels and mm. in learning abroad, but um, finding that for example, when I've moved back home, finding that there are kind of similarities in approach to kind of celebrating what we have um, here with nature, food, music, you know, like all those things that you were saying before, like, you know, there, there is all of that here. And I think there's just an opportunity to, to share it. Um, I think that there's space uh, to continue to share it. Mm. That's good. Chelsea, what about you? Do you want, oh, are you mic'd? Do you want a mic? You are now. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, the thing I kept thinking about just now is that, I don't know, there's something about thinking about the South and the tradition of what we're doing. Oh, y'all, this is about to take a turn. Mm. <laughs> um, but just imperialism and the fact that like, we all look a very certain way and we can see ourselves in the paintings of antiquity and it is easy to feel at home doing this because people who look like us have historically been the ones making this work. Oh yeah. And I don't have like an answer to this, but just that that's something that I can't help but think about. And I think about the role of making this today and hopefully making it accessible to more people who don't look like us. Um, I think that's gonna be an important piece of continuing this tradition in a way that we can feel really proud of moving forward. Absolutely, yeah, that's a really great, yeah, I mean, you really can't um, <laughs> talk about the American South without you know, the complexities of that. I think that's a really great point. And just the history of art in general. <laughs> yeah, exactly. As a portrait painter, it's, it's, a, con it's a conscious challenge. Yeah. Right? Um, because I, you know, if you're, if you're a commissioned artist, you're, you're, you are being commissioned to paint more often a very similar demographic, and yet I know a lot of us as painters wish to find beauty in all demographics. And, um, you know, I want, want it to be more, more so to, to like any opportunity that is available to us to, to paint. Um, in there just because of you know, as a, for me as a portrait painter, my res my responsibility and, and goal of art is to paint humanity as a whole, and you can't really do that if you're if you're only painting one tiny sliver of what humanity is. Um, I don't know if I'm really going anywhere with it, except I'm just processing. I think there's also a big difference in the culture down south because I've only been here for like almost two months and I think the whole southern hospitality thing rings pretty true. Like coming from Chicago, I feel like the mindset there is kind of like mind your own business and just kind of go on with your day. But here it's like we're at Harris Teeter and there was a lady grabbing a bundle of flowers and another lady just stopped her and was like, oh, these are gorgeous. And just like little things like that is kind of like a culture difference that we definitely don't always have in Chicago. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Crunch time. And get back. Try making the game. I hate myself right now. No. <laughs> the moment you no. said that. No, um, no. <laughs> the, no. If, it's, if it's what I think it is, don't. <laughs> <laughs> don't do it. Know what you're don't do this. <laughs> I, I, won't, I won't do if that to you, Louis. It's too late. I won't do that to you. It's already in my head. <laughs> For all of you out there that are very curious of what we're talking about, 
there was an earworm that in everyone's mind last night at the end of the evening. And I think, um, you know, we've been, we've been giggling about it the rest of this time. And uh, earlier, we, we were already singing it in our heads before we even started painting. So I'm trying to keep our the group together here. Oh, together, man. yeah. I was thinking about a different earworm. Oh. Okay. I was going to ask so much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we all switch paintings. <laughs> yes. Musical yeah. painting. Oh, that would be fun. Oh, well, that, that's something I think would be a blast to do in the future. Maybe that'll be a, another painting for life evening. Yeah, let's do it. It's like tell illustrations with paintings. Oh, my goodness. We had a uh, board game night together a little while ago, and um, I brought a game called Telestrations, which is kind of like Cards Against Humanity meets Pictionary in a way. Um, very, very fun. It's fun to, with artists, to do a, a drawing related game. But, wow. but what was so funny was how, w within our time limit, it's not like we could apply much of our skills. Yeah, so it's like all terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All, stick figures, all anyway. stick figures, all <laughs> really messy sketches. <laughs> a lot of fun. It was a, it was a really fun night. I feel like I need to make faster decisions. Yeah, about 40 minutes or 8.22. Ah. Yeah, this is the point in the painting where I, I've already done, like I've already set it up. This is not the time for drastic redraws. Yes. <laughs> This is the time where I've already set my set the stage. set my table here, and um, I'm working with what I have. But with the attitude that I this I'm creating this, so use your use that confidence. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, I need to put myself in timeout for that decision. By the time we get back to it, it'll be at the time's over. <laughs> this weird like the still life has just like a very repetitive shape right where I'm standing with the linen and so I cannot paint what's there because it would look awkward because it is awkward and I am probably too tired to make particularly good executive decisions on how to reconstruct this so it's not like samey, samey, samey. And Lewis, you might have to get mic'd for this, but do you want to talk about the like critique sessions that you're doing or like the webinar that you have coming up with Portrait Society? Oh, yeah.
Perfect. Okay. Um, so I we were talking about last night, and it seemed to be a point of, of something that, that people were interested in. But the I do an open critique night on, on my subscription platform. So for any of you that are subscribers to East Oak Studio, note that you you're welcome to join once a month. I, I you can submit a painting and I will uh, go through it and critique it. Um, and I'll, you know, Photoshop some stuff on it and give notes. And um, you can just join in or watch the recording later. It's just one of those things where you don't have to be there. But if you are there, there's an open chat so that you can participate in it. And it um, so that's um, <laughs> a time. So that is a thing. Um, and then also, um, the I do mentorships as well, and those are um, twice a week. You get an hour to you know. It, it typically runs over, um, which I'm totally fine with. Um, but uh, you get about an hour of time for for twice a twice a month to go over different exercises and to talk about your challenges and to see if there's any way that I might be able to help in that field. So um, anyway, it's, it's been a wonderful experience for a lot of people and they've really loved it. Also just another plug announcement for um, our sale that we have going on. We have a holiday sale for our paintings that we do here on uh, painting from life and um, want you to know that um, they are available for sale and um, they are help to make East Oaks continue to make these and um, help to support the artists that created them so um, feel free to uh, go to the site there's a link in the in the show notes and um, you know, uh, check check out and see what's sold, see what what's still available, and help feed an artist. Oh, also I have a, um, a webinar coming up with Portrait Society. Sorry, I keep forgetting about all the things. Um, that is December 7th. Um, if you're a part of our platform, it, it will be on our platform afterwards. Uh, for you to watch if you uh, so wish uh, but it is also um, going to be on how to uh, it's called the riff and it is how to uh, steal like an artist properly um, in respect to your influences not to mimic them So really excited about that too. I think that'd be a lot. Of, that's going to be a lot of fun. I just put the links in the chat on YouTube for the mentorship information, and then also for the direct link to the studio sale. And also Mustafa says, I always recommend to my students to subscribe to EOS. Many masters from different schools for $27. It's like having a fancy dinner with Scarlett Johansson for $40. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Mustafa, we love you, buddy. Thank you for always joining and being such a loyal follower of East Oaks. I'm very proud of all the things you're doing yourself. Uh, there's many people that are enjoying um, your teaching, I'm sure and um, hope that that continues. So everybody look up Mustafa Mahmoud's work. Um, he's, a, he's a dear, loyal follower of East Oaks and has been since the very beginning.
We have about 30 minutes left. Does anyone want to share like what their game plan is to kind of wrap up the painting? To not panic and make dumb decisions. I am making sure that my elements don't look too piecemeal, that there is a cohesion with all of the pieces. And so I'm you know, making some subtle changes and trying to not make too many drastic changes at this stage. Um, and then finding where, for example, there's some of this blue in maybe the garlic or where there's some of this pink and rosy oniony color in some of the other areas like the garlic or this white cloth and then I do need to add a few more elements to the eucalyptus but the idea that there's this harmony with everything and um, making sure that that's all that's all reading. Yeah, I'm just gonna gonna try to stay calm, <laughs> not uh, not mess anything up too terribly. We'll see. Benjamin Lester has a good question. We were actually talking about this the other day. Um, what do you all think about TV shows like the Portrait Artist of the Year? And would any of you participate in a show like that? It's the British one. Yeah, you're talking about yeah, that. Yeah, I, I hadn't heard of it until um, one of you brought it up the other day. Yeah, Tina, you brought that up, right? Mm -hmm. Well, never say never. You, you know, who knows? Gave Christian Hook his big break, right? Yep. I'm not like misremembering that. Yep, I think you're right. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think something like that be, would be really fun and really intimidating. I think the kind of cool thing about it is that they really intentionally invite. As far as I can tell, it's intentional. Um, painters of a lot of different levels. Mm. Um, yeah, there's something about British TV that I feel like is very accessible on this amateur level and it's very like amateur friendly. Thinking about like Bake Off or something like that. Mm -hmm. mm. a lot of like British TV there's always this ethos of like yes it's a competition and we can also help our fellow competitors yeah. you know it's it's like a competition nice. and yet it's American. team building <laughs> we yeah. have to win <laughs> yeah I don't know I think it it would be fun but probably a fairly Significant time investment. Do you know like how long the contestants stay for? The initial round I think is a day. It's, it's oh. one session and then they Look at that group of painters who are painting from that one model and they Narrow it down to like the top a handful. I don't know if it's top two or top one or top four but and then you go on to another round and I don't know how much later that's filmed um, and I know by the time it's like down to just two people they give you time to go like develop paintings so I was wondering um, if it was more of an a la prima situation or like how do how would they organize it if, I, you know you could I think potentially 
potentially, so long as you could do something in one sitting, mm -hmm. if you were like a finalist, you would have time to do something that's slower. Mm -hmm. I yeah, like the idea of doing like different challenges, you know, like as, as we paint, you know, how, how can we kind of adapt to different situations or I think that's fun, fun to do. Another really good show, if you like the, um, Portrait Artist of the Year is the Great Pottery Throwdown, which is another British TV show, and it's it's so wholesome. It's just like a bunch of people trying to make pottery, and it's like a competition show, but it's it's the best kind. I love that show. I freaked out when I first found out about it. Um, I bet you did. Yeah, it was. Oh, it's so good. Have you seen it, Louis? No, I'm not. Oh my gosh, we should watch it. East Oak Studio movie night. Yay. I'll bring the popcorn. All the way from the kitchen. All the way from the <laughs> kitchen. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Yes. Some, some parts, some of it. <laughs> I think bad art, good walls. It's fun. <laughs> and then Benjamin also asks in regards to the the TV show of like painting the portrait from life in four hours. Um, he asks, how stressed would you be doing a four hour portrait from life? <laughs> as stressed as I am, every painting from life that we do. <laughs> no. But maybe More we're so. really prepared for it. Like, yeah, <laughs> maybe, maybe this, I've been preparing my whole life for this. <laughs> All right, well, I'm not gonna get that olive oil in like I hoped, but maybe I can get the rest of this cloth in. I know. Oh. Honestly, I got a lot going on anyway, so <laughs> I need to I need to pull back anyway. And are these paintings once they're done, will some of these be included in the studio sale? They absolutely will. Absolutely will. I even wanted to work on the bread again. I have so much to do on the bread. Mm, mm, mm. This is my favorite part of the night when everyone gets deadly silent because they're trying so hard to finish the painting. Yeah, everybody's like, ask somebody else the question. I can't, I just, just can't, I can't. We also have someone in the chat named Lapis Exilus that says, hit the like button, everyone, which would be very sweet if everyone were to like the video. <laughs> Thank you for, for uh, standing up and promoting that.
And Mustafa is coming in with a fun fact. He says, do you know what Tina means in Arabic? It means a fig. So my name, my name is Fig Figarelli. Fig Figarelli. That's amazing. I think you should just carry that, <laughs> that tradition on. I'm imagining your signature instead of your name, like just a fig. Fig, fig. What is our time situation now? We're at 841. And if there's anyone like in the chat that's painting along with us, you can always post it on Instagram and tag us because we'd love to see if you guys are painting and if you're trying your hand at this still life as well. Evie, I really love how you are putting in the eucalyptus right now. Just like slight notes of it looks great. Yeah, I kind of had questioned <laughs> how, if, and yeah, if I was going to do it and how. Um, but I think, um, so kind of again, what, what I had mentioned uh, at the start of a streaming tonight, um, how I was thinking I wanted to create a, a center of focus through the composition, like kind of like getting a little bit more, more detail in, in this line of sight here, and then just kind of like abbreviating um, everything else. Almost as if you're like, Mm, focusing like a camera lens in, in a sense. We have a comment from Benjamin Lester. He says, this is the point in the painting when the client changes their mind about important compositional elements. <gasps> <laughs> And then Mustafa has a question for Erica. When you were in Florence Academy, were you priming your canvas the traditional way that master Daniel Graves teaches, or were you just working on the pre-prime stuff? I personally was working on Classens 20 or Classens 66. Um, that's what uh, one of the kind of introductory canvases that we were using. Um, but then we were taught how to do it ourselves which was really cool. So I was in the camp where um, I have a bunch of notes on how to do it, but I uh, 
haven't gone too much into uh, prepping my own canvases for my student work, mostly because I think I was so, um, I was full of information on, on just the technique of painting that materials felt like an overwhelming um, thing. And so um, I was spending a lot of my time focusing on, the, on technique and less about doing my own materials, but not because it's not interesting or not a, a good thing to get into. Um, I just had my limits <laughs> of like how much I could do at once. It's a lot. It's a lot to take in. I was like, what is a shadow shape? <laughs> But I'm glad, like, when I was a student, I went to every lecture. Anything that ever happened, I was like, I'm here, I'm going to learn everything. And so I have copious notes, <laughs> again, on, um, on, like, rabbit skin glue and, like, different pigments and all this stuff. So it's like, I have my bits of research. <laughs> Were you required to always make your own rabbit skin glue? Uh, we weren't ever required. Okay, you know. that's good. Like that, like we were using, um, like I was using, for example, the lessons and stuff. Like okay, yeah. The pre already prepared uh, canvas. Um, Making it. But we did do our it. own toning of our own paper. That was a thing. Where, where we were setting up our casts, um, we toned our own paper for that, and which was really cool because you got to. Um, choose, for example, the look of how much white chalk you wanted and kind of adapt to the lighting of your, of your setup and, and being really close to or seeing how your materials can and, and like having your own hand in, in, the, in the making of your materials. Sorry, my brain is trying to do two things at once. So. Yeah. <laughs> this is our way of distracting you so we get ahead. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. It's all strategy. So what I'm trying to say is, it's a great thing to experiment with, and prepping your own prepping your own materials. Post graduation, I did make a few panels, um, gluing canvas onto wood, and gessoing wood panels. Um, I did do a little bit of that. Chelsea, did you do a little bit of uh, living to fight another day over there? I'm not sure what that entails, but I, um, I got to the point where I realized I wasn't sure what decisions to make mm. anymore, and I didn't want to do stuff just for the sake of doing stuff. Mm. Gotcha. Yeah. Wise. Yeah, in a, in a perfect world, or in a situation where the still life weren't coming down, I would be probably quicker to make that decision. Mm-hmm. Yeah, part of the reason I'm parked here is so that if I if I see something I can just walk up and yeah, do take care thing. of it. Yeah. But I'm enjoying watching y'all paint at the same time. <laughs> I think everyone's paintings look fantastic. This is one of my favorite still life setups that we've done so far. Oh, that's awesome. Gotta fix my bottle. Aye, aye, Captain. Oh! <laughs> Scrape it all off, yeah. Yeah, yeah, let's start over. <laughs> Did Twitter die? While we were painting, I think Twitter what? died. What do you what mean? From yeah. Musk? Like, 
like like they deactivated all employees badges like the, there was there was talk that he was going to shut it down uh, <laughs> <laughs> whoops you heard it here folks first <laughs> like, are we the, reacting to the news right now I actually, I had a Twitter account, never used it. <laughs> Who would you say his name was Twitter? Never heard of him. Uh, give me the countdown. Where where are we? Nine minutes. Mm. Nope. Don't give up, Evie. <laughs> well, I'm trying to decide. I've sort of like yesterday. I sketched in um, some of these like little shallots and garlic and whatever over here, and I have. Completely not put that. Yeah, I'm trying to decide if I want to abbreviate it all or just. I like what you did. Okay. Yeah. I especially like the light that's being cast through the olive oil onto the linen. That's yeah, really that was great. that was really fun. It's so just like the biggest color pop in the whole thing. And I'm, I'm also thinking, I want to add, just because there is that super bright yellow pop, I want to put in like a little bit of manganese violet in the shadow here next to it. Just a little bit of violet in there. We have a comment from William Galvez. He says, hi guys, thank you so much for the invite. This is my first time with East Oak Studios. Oh, nice. Yay. Well, we're glad to have you. Keep on joining. This is usually the time of the night where everyone gets very silent yeah. because yeah, they are rushing. So just keep that in mind. They are trying to finish their paintings in the um, six minutes that we have. Tina, you're doing a great job of keeping an eye on the clock for us. Thank you. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Some high stakes painting going on here. And then Lapis also commented and says, everyone's work is so beautiful. Oh, thank mm. you. Jolene also says, beautiful work, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. Oh, the same to you. I hope everyone has a happy Thanksgiving.
tell you one thing, I'll, I'll be spending the rest of the evening fixing edges. And we also have Sam McClaymore, who also has really great work on Instagram, and they're very, very sweet. Um, they say, I'm working on my own painting and not this still life, but it is nice just painting along with other people. All your paintings look great. Sounds like my favorite, though. Love it when people are painting along and just enjoy, enjoying um, each other while, while we all work hard together. It's part of the fun of it, I think. Yeah, letting painting be a group activity <laughs> rather than a solitary one. Yep. And Joy says, I love having two sessions because it gives time to polish a bit each of your fabulous paintings. Happy Thanksgiving to all. Happy Thanksgiving to you. It is this the set and doing two sessions has been fun. We'll, we'll ha, you know maybe we'll do a few more in the future. This is kind yes, of like please. one of those <laughs> guinea pig things to try and um, yeah, especially for still life. This is great. We're doing a bonus surprise, everybody. We're going to do a bonus night tomorrow night. <laughs> right now, in our heads, we're like, yeah, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right. <laughs> Christine says, so interesting to see how three artists interpret the same still life. Lovely work, each of you, with a challenging setup. Thank you. One of my favorite things about painters is so many ways to approach the same thing. kids. We have another jokester in the chat. Uh, Benjamin says, it's interesting how one of your paintings is so much better than the others. LOL, JK. <laughs> <laughs> Let them guess who it is. Yes. <laughs> Way to stir the pot. And there's this like little cavity where the olive oil was supposed to be. It's just sitting, hanging out. It's the enigma part of the painting. Yes, like, exactly. Oh, what could it be? <laughs> it was all part of the design. <laughs> all right, everyone. Well, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, some definitely these these paintings will be on the same uh, platform for sale uh, for the holiday. We'll be giving them to Kelly um, later this week to put up there. So if sign up for our email list and you will be uh, informed uh, that they are up 
on our email list so that we'll have new paintings up and but hopefully before um, you know the holiday season so maybe you can get something for somebody as a present so thank you all so much for joining us we really enjoy doing these things we hope to continue to do them and we're going to continue to build on and hopefully make them even better and grander for you so uh, without um, anybody else want to say anything thank you for everyone tina especially in the back who has been so sweet to switch her for us this evening hopefully sometime in the future you'll get to see her paint one of these as well so Evie, Chelsea, Erica, for all of y'all joining. Um, thank y'all so, so much again, and we'll see you next time.